Welcome back to the fourth part of lecture series for stone masonry. So today we'll discuss stone masonry for the following building components. So first we have the foundation, then the retaining wall, lintels, arches, coping, steps, flooring and cladding. First and foremost we'll discuss stone masonry for foundations. So as you find in the image on the right, Stone masonry footing is a structural foundation constructed to support walls. Its main purpose is to support structural walls and to transfer the load to the soil beneath it. It should also serve its purpose without settlement or sinking of the building. The load exerted on a stone masonry footing should be vertical as you find here in the image. So next we'll discuss the case of dimensions of excavation for stone masonry footing. Here prior to the construction of a stone masonry footing, a trench with depth ranges from 1 meter to 1.5 meter should be excavated. The width of excavation would be controlled by the amount of loads exerted on the footing. So the width of the footing is specified based on the imposed loads and properties of the soil on which the footing is constructed. So here we have three types of soil and each has its own foundation height and foundation widths. We have three types of soil like we have hard soil, ramp soil and soft soil. As in case of hard soil, the foundation height should be a minimum of 30 centimeters and the foundation width should be 40 centimeters minimum. And in the case of ramp soil, the minimum foundation height should be 50 centimeters and foundation width should be 60 centimeters. And in case of soft soil, the minimum foundation height should be 80 centimeters and foundation width should be 70 centimeters. So that's about foundation. Now let's move on to the next part. Now let's examine the construction steps for stone masonry footing. So prior to the construction of stone masonry footing, a trench with a depth ranges from 1 meter to 1.5 meter should be excavated. So then the soil at the bottom of the trench needs to be compacted properly as you find here. And after the trench is dug, a layer of plain cement concrete or PCC will be poured at the bottom of the trench. So after the plain cement concrete is set, the first stone masonry course can be installed in the trench with a layer of mortar underneath. As you find here, the first stone masonry course can be installed. The bottom layer we have the PCC above which we have the stone masonry. Okay guys, now let's watch a video presentation by Ultra Tech Cement on stone masonry foundation. A stone masonry footing is a structural foundation for walls. The purpose of a masonry foundation is to support the weight of the structure and transfer the loads safely to the ground without sinking or settlement. Before building stone masonry footings, trenches to a depth of about 1 to 1.5 meters are dug and the soil is rammed well. Then a layer of plain cement concrete made of one part of cement, four parts of sand and eight parts of coarse aggregates that is 40 millimeter is laid to a thickness of 100 to 150 millimeters. The projection of the bed concrete from the lowest course of masonry is usually 150 millimeters. The footing is built over this bed. The foundation is built in courses in a stepped manner. All stones shall be wetted before use. Each stone shall be placed close to stones previously laid on 1 is to 6 cement mortar. The joint thickness shall not be more than 20 millimeters. Face stones shall be arranged suitably to stagger the vertical joints and long vertical joints shall be avoided.
Bond or through stones running right through the thickness of walls shall be provided at regular intervals. Wider wall foundations may require a set of two or more bond stones overlapping each other. Stones for hearting or interior filling shall be put into the position as close as possible and ensure that those are firmly embedded in the mortar. No hollow space shall be left anywhere in the masonry. Ensure that no water is poured in the joints to facilitate easy packing. Stones used for masonry should be strong, hard, tough and free from cracks and cavities. Provide a plain cement concrete bed of 100 to 150 mm thick. Width of the PCC bed shall be 300 mm more than the bottom most course of the foundation. Use bond stones at regular intervals of 1 meter. They should be laid staggered in successive courses. Harting stones should be packed as closely as possible and firmly embedded in mortar. Now let's move on to the next part. It's the stone masonry for retaining walls. Here we have the definition of retaining wall. It states that retaining walls may be defined as a wall built to resist the pressure of liquid earth filling sand or other granular material filled behind it after its build. So here the definition is pretty simple. It says that retaining wall is something which resists the pressure of a material filled behind it after it is built. And it's commonly required in the construction of hill roads, masonry dams, abutments and being walls of bridges and so on. Depending upon the site conditions, type of material to be retained and the height of wall to be constructed, retaining wall may be built in various ways like dry stone masonry, stone masonry, brick masonry with plain cement concrete and reinforced cement concrete. And in the image on the right, you will find two types of retaining walls. That's a double-faced stone retaining wall and single-faced stone retaining wall. In case of double-faced retaining walls, we have a facing stone and a backing stone. And the inner part is built with rubbles and harding stones. We have through stones or bonding stones as in case of other stone walls and in the second case that's the single faced walls we have only the facing stone and it's devoid of the backing stones and here the wall blends seamlessly into the space behind it the cobbles and smaller stones graded into the retained fill the cobbles and smaller stones just blends into the retained fill behind it. So here the wall is well constructed and tightly packed on the outer face. So that's about two types of retaining walls. Here we have the stone retaining walls out of dry stone masonry. So this is the simplest form of retaining wall. Here the stability of wall depends upon the arrangement of stones in the wall and the friction between individual stones. Here the wall should have a minimum top width of 60 cm and the front face should have a batter varying from 1 in 4 to 1 in 3. Which means for every 4 cm vertical rise of the retaining wall there should be a horizontal recession by 1 cm on, on the front face of the wall. So here as you find in the image, batter is a receding slope of a wall structure or earthwork and a wall sloping in the opposite direction is said to overhang. So here, batter is a recession and a overhang is a projection. The batter of 1 in 4 is adopted for walls lesser than 4.5 meter in height. 
in principle the height of dry stone masonry wall should be restricted to 6 meters for walls above 4.5 meter in height the portion above 4.5 meter is usually built of dry rubble stone masonry and the portion below this height is built with mortar. So that's about retaining walls. Now let's move on to the next topic and it's the stone lintels. As you know, lintels are the supportive structures across an opening like a door or window. In case of Stone lintels, rectangular bits of stone can be utilized for the purpose. So this type of lintel is mainly used in this area where stone is plentifully accessible. Then they are merely used in mountainous buildings as they weigh too much and due to the non-availability of other materials for construction. The thickness of the stone lintel is a significant factor for its design. Please note that the depth of stone lintel is kept equal to 10 cm per meter of the span and should provide minimum 15 cm as the depth. And the lintels are used up to a span of 2 meters. There are few inconveniences also of the stone lintel. First, its high cost and secondly, its inability to withstand excessive transverse stress. So the vertical stress is called the transverse stress. And due to their weak tensile nature, they are not used in buildings for vibratory loads are subjected to the structure. So these types of stone lintels are not used in buildings where there are vibrate lead rods. Now let's move on to the next topic. It's stone arches. Based on workmanship, these are subdivided into two types. They are the rubble arches and the echelon arches. So, as you find here in the image, rubble arches are very weak and used only for inferior work. These are used up to a span of 1 meter. These are made of rubble stones which are hammer dressed roughly to shape and size and fixed in cement mortar. Sometimes these are also used as relieving arches up to a depth of 37.5 cm. A relieving arch is an arch built over a lintel to relieve or distribute the weight of the wall above. So, a relieving arch is an additional structure provided so as to distribute the weight of the wall above. So, if the depth is more, we can go for two rings in alternate course of headers and stretchers. But here in the image, they have provided only one ring. So, now let's check the next type of arch. It's called the Ashlar arch. So in this type, the stones are cut to proper shape of Vuswa. A Vuswa is a wedge shape or tapered stone used to construct an arch. As you see here, if as you find in the image, so this is called a Vuswa. Ashera stones are also used to make flat arches and for determining the wedge shape of Uswa, it's preferable to set out the arch on a level platform marking on it the keystone and Uswa along with the radial mortar joints. Let me repeat, for determining the wedge shape of Uswa, it's preferable to set out the arch on a level platform as you find here in the image marking on it the keystone and Vuswa along with radial mortar joints. There are different types of Eschler stone arches. First, we have the joggle and rebated joints in flat touch of Eschler stones, and we have the semicircular arch, segmental arch, and flat arch. So, these are various types of Ashlar stone arches. 
now let's look into how we can build a stone arch to build an arch you start with two low wall sections of equal height on either side of a gap that's the planned width of an arch as you find here in the image you start with two low wall sections of equal height on either side of a gap the gap is the planned width of the arch then use a wooden form a half circle cut in the desired curve of the final arch as a support here you use a wooden form as the support and then you begin at the wall edges you place stones at the wall edges means at the ends of the wooden support and then build up along the sides with wedge shaped stones in fact here we use wedge shaped stones for constructing an arch so you work on each side bringing them closer together and the wooden form keeps everything in place while you work so you need not worry about the failure of the structure at present so this is a temporary wooden form work which is removed once the arch is closed and this one is the method the arch stones placed according to the radius of a semicircle so in fact it's placed according to the radius of a semicircle so when you get to the top you place the most important stone which is called the keystone in the center stone in fact keystone is the center stone of the arch that holds the structure together the keystone when placed correctly locks other stones in position after you have constructed the shape of the arch then you remove the wooden support and the arch remains standing so that's all about how to construct a stone arch now let's move on to the next topic it's the stone copping so as you know copping consists of capping or covering of a wall a copping stone is a flat stone that forms part of a copping and it's used to cap freestanding walls so in fact these flat copping stones are available in different thickness and lengths which vary from 300 mm to 10,000 mm and which ranging from 150 mm to 530 mm and now you can find various benefits of having a copping stone first these are massively important when it comes to your walling project and they protect walls from weather damage and come complete with drip checks which helps to keep water away from the wall so uh, the newly manufactured types of copping stones they protect walls from weather damage and they helps to keep water away from the wall so that's all about stone copping the next topic is stone steps as you know natural stone is an ideal material to use for stairs literally different types of stones are used for construction of stone stairs we use different types of stones such as marble granite conglomerates and limestone the stone used for the construction of stairs should be hard strong and resistant to wear in fact stone stairs are widely used in places where ashla stone is readily available there are in fact five different types of stone steps or stone stairs we'll discuss each type in detail first let's check into detail the type of rectangular steps so these are the simplest type prepared from rectangular blocks of stone ashla as you find here in the image the steps are arranged with the front edge of one step resting on the upper back edge of the step below with rebated joint cut into it let me repeat here the steps are arranged with the front edge of one step resting on the upper back edge of the step below with rebated joint cut into it so this is the front edge of one step 
and this one is the upper back edge of the step below so pretty simple so that's about rectangular steps let's check into the case of slab thread and riser steps in this step flat stones are used as thread and risers similar to that of timber steps in fact flat stones are flat stones used for paving etc here these stone slab risers and threads may be connected through doubles the stone slab risers and threads may be connected to doubles Devil is a projecting pack used for holding together components of a structure as you find here in the image. So the thickness of stone slabs may vary from 5 cm to 8 cm. So that's about slab, thread and riser strip. Now we have the third type, it's called the spandrel strips. So these strips are nearly triangular in shape as you find here, so as to get a plain soffit. Soffit means the underside of a stair or other architecture component. At the end, each step is built in the wall. So such steps gives pleasant appearance. We can find different types of spandrel steps like the plain soffit. Here the underside is plain and we have the broken soffit. We have broken underside and we have the molded soffit here the underside of the steps or staircase is like a molded form so that's about spandrel steps now we can find the fourth type of stone steps it's called the cantilever thread slab step the peculiarity of this type of stone step is that here we can't find risers so these steps are formed by threads only and these are made of thick stone slabs without any riser. So the thread slab is fixed at one end into the board and act as a cantilever. Cantilever is a type of structure where its one end is only fixed to the wall. So the steps may be either rectangular or triangularly shaped. We can find the two types here in the image. So the next step is the built up steps. So these steps use threads and risers in the form of thin sawn stone or marble slabs placed over brick or concrete steps. It's like a covering type where we place stone slabs, thin sawn stone or marble slabs over a brick staircase or a concrete staircase. This act as a covering type. So the thickness of a stone slab may vary from 2 to 5 centimeters. So that's all about stone steps or stone staircase. Now let's move on to the next topic. It's the stone flooring. As you know, among the flooring materials, none is more elegant and luxurious than natural stone. Different types of natural stones are used for flooring which includes slate, marble, limestone, travertine, granite and sandstone. Now let's look into the properties of stones used for flooring. We have two main properties. First is the absorption rating. So it refers to how porous a given material is. The more absorbent it is the more susceptible the stone will be to stain. Absorbent stone can also be prone to cracking damage if it is subjected to freezing conditions. So natural stones vary greatly in their absorption rate with sandstone being the most porous and granite the most impervious to water absorption. So usually we prefer granite than sandstone for flooring as granite is most impervious to water absorption. Further, an absorbent stone, as I mentioned, can be prone to cracking damage if subjected to freezing conditions. So that's about the first. So the next property is oxidation. 
As you know, natural stone materials are formed beneath the earth over millions of years and often it contains variety of elements such as iron. So the main issue here is in an outdoor environment these traces of iron can oxidize in a process more commonly known as rusting. So this can cause the entire tunnel to degenerate over time. So these are the two properties of stone used for flooring. We have the absorption rating and then we have the oxidation. Now we can find numerous benefits of using natural stone for flooring. Stone tiles are natural, non-polluting and eco-friendly. Purchasing stones which are acquired locally can cut down the environmental impact of transport. Now let's move on to the last topic of this lecture, stone cladding. Now stone cladding is a stone veneer or a manufactured stone applied to a building or other structure made of a material other than stone. Here stone veneer is a thin layer of any stone used as a decorative facing material that is not meant to be lot bearing. Please note, so the decorative facing material is not meant to be lot bearing. So natural stone veneer is made from real stone that is either collected, that is field stone or quarried. The stone is cut to a consistent thickness and wait for use as a veneer. Here in the image on the right, you can find stone veneer applied on casting place concrete wall. First, a metal lathe is fixed on the wall above which a mortar scratch coat is applied. Now, Scratch coat is the first coat applied in plastering having lines scratched on its surface to improve the bond with the next coat. So this is otherwise called as the first coat. So here in the image you can find horizontal scratches made with a scrapifier. Next motor setting bed is applied over the scratch coat on which the veneers are fixed. So that's how we fix a stone veneer on cast in place concrete wall. Now take a look at the image on the screen. Here we are fixing stone veneer on a metal stud wall. In case of a wall with metal studs, fiberglass insulators are filled between these studs. Then an exterior gypsum sheathing is fixed on the studs above which two layers of water resistant barriers are applied. Rest of the process is as same as that in the case of fixing stone cladding on concrete wall. That is, we fix a metal light on the water resistant barrier followed by applying scratch coat mortar and then fixing the stone veneer with mortar setting bed. So guys, that's about the topics related to stone cladding and thus we have completed the topics on stone masonry. Now students, just take a look at these university questions. I hope you could answer all of these by now. So bye for now and see you in the next lecture. Thank you.